Wonderful. Okay. Um, so here we go. We're just going to hop in. Um, I realize I should probably, I, I didn't put in a conflict of interest slide. Uh, I'm a consultant for USON Institute and I consult for Novartis a little bit on one of their new products. Here are the questions that we're going to try to tackle in this talk. How did we get here and why have psychedelics created such a ruckus? Why will different depressive conditions respond differently to psilocybin and will this affect how the agent, it should be affect, how the agent is used or FDA approved? How do psychedelics work? How will... Uh, how will how psychedelics work impact how they're used clinically? And at the end, I'm just going to, if I have time, talk briefly about this concept that I've been working on of consciousness-based pharmacotherapy. These questions are all interrelated to each other, although they seem somewhat different. But if I'm successful in this talk, what I hope I will have convinced you of is that understanding or beginning to understand how they work and how they're used are interchangeable. They're sort of two sides of the same coin. Okay. So I came into the psychedelic space in 2000, in 2015, um, I moved up here to do this. And, you know, in 2015, this looked like a, sort of a mission of mercy. Um, psychedelic agents were perceived as old compounds that had been marketed previously, largely by Sandoz, which marketed both LSD and psilocybin. They did not seem to us to have any commercial value, particularly. So it was really a nonprofit game. And there was this sense that maybe nonprofits could sort of slide in under the FDA wire because thousands of people had taken these agents. So as Bill Linton, who founded uh, USONA, often ruefully says, you know, well, how difficult could it be? And of course, the answer is unbelievably expensive and difficult as the FDA has gotten more and more careful. But in 15, there were really three, there were three people in the space. There was Hefter, which was a small research-based organization. There was MAPS, then MAPS was out ahead of the game then, working on FDA approval for MDMA combined with psychotherapy. And USONA was this newly minted uh, nonprofit medical research organization. Um, and that's how we saw it. What we didn't see coming, of course, was this insane explosion of commercial interest. This is the most recent of these bullseyes. Let me remind everybody too, if you just mute yourself, I still hear somebody uh, back there, out there, and I just I don't want you to say something that everybody hears. Um, every one of these little bits of 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 writing is a company trying to get something that's psychedelic related to approval. And I won't go into the bullseye. I just want to show you that, in fact, there was this crazy explosion of psychedelic of interest. Lots of millions and millions, a couple of billion dollars at least, flowed into the space. Many people got into it. Many sort of folks from Silicon Valley world that didn't really understand the ins and outs of pharmaceutical development. Many of these entities have crashed or will crash, but it was crazy. Um, none of us saw this coming. And here's the other thing that I did not see coming, although I, 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 I kind of pat myself on the back that amongst my colleagues, I was the only one when Denver decriminalized psilocybin who said, you know what, this is like, it's a little bit, not in a bad way, but you know how COVID started, we think in a market in Wuhan, you know, it didn't look like a big deal when Oakland and Denver decriminalized these things. But once you caught the flavor that it might be possible for states to work out legislation that would allow psychedelic agents to be used clinically in ways that look a lot like what you usually need FDA approval for, Katie barred the door. Now, Oregon is kind of an odd situation. They are, I think, going to turn out to be sort of a historical legacy in many ways. If you're interested in this, watch Colorado because Colorado, and I have some involvement with this, basically they are setting up a system where you as a clinician could pack your bags, you know, uh, you know, cross from Raton to Trinidad or whatever, you know, set up shop in Colorado. And uh, I could come see you for my major depression or my OCD or my PTSD. And you're going to be able to, after you get the, the relevant training, you're going to be able to treat me like a psych patient. You're going to get, you know, unheard of. Cannabis never went here. It, 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 my mind is blowing and other states are moving in this direction. Massachusetts has something on the ballot. California does. Utah just passed a, a measure where a couple of the large healthcare systems can now potentially treat people with psilocybin. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So, so, you know, it's like the little spark that blew into a massive forest fire. And it's a really interesting question to ask, well, you know, like the old talking head song, you know, how did this happen? How, how did we get here? Um, and there's a couple of reasons, but here is, I think, the first reason. So psychedelics were gathering steam, you know, starting with Roland Griffith's sort of seminal publication. We're really starting with Rick Strassman at your place back in the 90s, but certainly, you know, by the 
by 2006. But it was these two studies, one done at Hopkins, one done at NYU, that were the first randomized studies. They were small studies, but they compared uh, the high dose of psilocybin to a, some sort of placebo comparator. In people that were generally high functioning, did not have significant histories of depression, mostly, and who were clinically anxious and depressed because they were dying of cancer or at risk of dying of cancer. And I'll show you the graph in just a second, but here I'm just pointing out to you um, the, the headline at the time from the New York Times, a dose of hallucinogen from a magic mushroom. But the key thing is the lasting piece because what these early studies showed, and let's just look over at the NYU and uh, the Hopkins studies over on the left in the box on the left, I, I, what what they say, basically, the, the complicated graphs is you take these folks, they are clinically struggling. They're depressed, they're anxious, more depressed in the Hopkins study, more anxious in the uh, NYU study. You give them, you know, on average, it worked out to about 22 milligrams of psilocybin, and not from a mushroom that was synthesized. Um, you do it with a classic set and setting approach. They get hours of preparation ahead of time. They got two therapists with them during the dosing session. They get a couple of integration sessions afterwards. And in both the NYU and the, the Hopkins sample, that one treatment produced incredibly high rates of remission six months later. So like, you know, like, like, like 60, 70, 75% of the people, depending on whether they were dosed first or second in the Hopkins study, were in remission. They had a HAMD less than seven. These, the average score was 25 coming in. I, I remember looking at these data. I felt like Salieri, you know, in Amadeus, where he's looking at Mozart's, you know, uh, the, the scripts, and there's no corrections. You know, Mozart's just writing it down perfectly. I, I thought I was looking into the eye of God when I saw this stuff, because it looked like a cure. It's like, oh my God, these people, you know. And then, you know, MDMA for PTSD, it's been it's been really problematized in the last couple of years, but but the data from studies are still pretty consistent that you know people go through the twelve week three dose MDMA psychotherapy uh, protocol, and not only do they have very very high rates of of resolving their PTSD, but in, if anything, the improvements are bigger down the road. It, as time passes, people seem, at least in terms of their PTSD, to do better. Now, what what all these studies, what these three studies are for, what these, you know, what this data set has in common is that these were all people that were struggling with a particular problem. You know, the PTSD people had can have all sorts of problems, but generally the focus of the therapy is on a, a problem or a small constellation of related traumatic problems. The cancer people had cancer problems and, and many of their psychedelic experiences were focused on the cancer and many of the experiences directly um, emotionally addressed their fears about dying of cancer. And I, I think there's something, and again, folks, if everybody could mute, uh, please just check your thing and mute so that we don't hear you. Um, uh, there's an important point here, I think. I can't prove this to you, but I think it's very striking that these agents, when you're, when you're struggling with a problem that can be addressed by the psychological experience occasioned by the psychedelic agent, there seems to be the signal, boom, big effect, rapid effect, and then this sort of long-term maintenance of effect that was really striking because, of course, we know that is not the case with standard antidepressants. We now know from many, many studies that you take people and put them on an SNRI or an SSRI and you put them in remission, and they can be in remission for months to years, and then if you randomize them to either you know, remain on that drug or blindly be rolled over to placebo, the rates of crashing are stupendous. And of course, even on people that stay on their antidepressants, we now know that many people relapse, you know, over the six to 12 months after starting treatment. So this was really, really novel. And this is part of why I think there was this spectacular gold rush that occurred. Um, of course, the other part is that, okay, so there was this indication that these might be kind of miracle cures. There's the fact that standard antidepressants, we now know work far less well than we thought they worked 20, 30 years ago. And psychedelics were not novelties in the Western world, right? Many people that were of an age that they're now in positions of power have had very powerful psychedelic experiences in the 60s and 70s. And, uh, you know, one of the interesting things about doing a job like mine is people come out of the wood woodwork, they talk to you, and you'd be amazed, or maybe you wouldn't be, how many very prominent people over the years have talked to me about the fact that they're 
lives were changed by a psychedelic experience. They just never told anybody because it was, you know, it was stigmatized. So the FDA did not have a category for getting approval for people that were under existential distress because they were dying of cancer. They made it very clear to everybody that you'd have to pursue something like major depressive disorder. Now, this, instead of being a downside, I think was the other thing that really launched this $100, $100 billion investment, quote unquote, opportunity, because major depression is one of the major uh, causes of you know health disability in the world. It's a massive market. Um, the treatments we have are suboptimal. So there's gazillions of potential dollars at stake. And, you know, starting at about 18 or 2000, 2019, there was this, oh my God, it just, it was an insane explosion. Here you go. You see field trip, they've come and gone. Um, you know, it was overblown and, and, but this is what happened now, you know, so if all of a sudden you're going to commercialize these agents and you're going to get patents and you're going to fight about patents and all this kind of, frankly, I'm an old guy, so I wasn't surprised, but it's still kind of discouraging. You know, it's 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 dog eat dog business as, as usual in the you know in the pharmacotherapy space here now with psychedelics. So what are you going to do? Well, you know, an obvious target is treatment resistant depression. If you're going to go for depression, it's by far the urgent unmet clinical need, at least the the acute unmet clinical need. The vast the you know treatment resistance accounts for a huge amount of the cost of depression, large writ larger. Um, it's the best target for insurance reimbursement. And um, if you're trying to go for something international, you, you may be less required to have a third arm in your registration trials in the EU. So interestingly, treatment resistant depression was the first thing that was gone after. Now I'm gonna do something. I've made a, a choice here just in the interest of time today, which is I'm gonna show you studies that are larger FDA registration type trials. I'm, I'm not gonna show you any more of the smaller academic studies like those cancer studies that I was talking about. Because once we get these large studies, like this is the Compass Pathways 2B study in, in treatment resistant depression. Once we get these studies, you begin to get a more accurate view of how psychedelics might look out in the marketplace because these studies are, they're larger by far generally. They're done at multiple sites. Um, they have multiple reasons why it's harder to get these huge effect sizes, you know, all effect sizes shrink when you go from a phase two to a phase three or from small academic studies into these types of phase two studies. So this is now at this point in time, the largest study that's been done in a psychedelic space. Um, it's also by far the largest study done in a depressive disorder and certainly in treatment resistant depression or TRD. So it's a compass study. It's a three arm study. They randomized people to either a one milligram dose of psilocybin a 10 milligram dose of psilocybin or a 25 milligram dose of psilocybin. One dose administered with, you know, standard brand set and setting approach. So some preparation ahead of time, a couple people in the rooms with you, monitors, facilitators are not called therapists, but they're there in case, you know, you have trouble. And then a couple of integration sessions afterwards. They set their primary endpoint at week three. In FDA type trials, you live or die in your primary endpoint. If you don't hit your primary endpoint, you can hit every other endpoint. Doesn't matter. Your 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 study's a failure. Often your company goes out of business and you're finished, right? So so a three week primary endpoint was conservative on the point uh, on the part of Compass. <laughs> they followed for twelve weeks. Oh, again, if you could silence yourself, please. Everybody, just check your mute button. Um, they followed people out for twelve weeks. Now, what they didn't say originally was that after week three, they allowed people to go back on antidepressants. And about 35 to 40% of everybody in the study, regardless of whether they got the 25 milligram target dose or the placebo, the one milligram dose, about 35, 40% in each group went back on antidepressants after week three. So that tells you something right away, that this, this was not a curative study for these people. Um, they had about 70, 75 people per arm, one dose, and then you can see the follow-up schedule. And here is the standard published uh, outcome. And so let's take a look at it. Um, you start out at zero because you're, you're not measuring how depressed people are. You're going to measure their change score. Down is good. Minus means this is how many depressive symptom points you're losing. Day two is one day after dosing. And so what you can see is a beautiful dose response curve here. The 25 milligram arm is in blue. The 10 milligram arm is in green. The, the the gray arm is one milligram. So the I've circled the fact that within a day, 
you see a really robust drop of almost 16 points. That's a good drop in a MADRAS score in the 25 milligram group. This also suggests that it's not simply a placebo or an expectancy, that there's something going on. Those factors may be interacting with the psilocybin dose, but the fact that there's a dose response relationship here strongly suggests that, th that there's the medication plus the way it's delivered, it's it's not all random. There's something that you're getting this sort of, the medicine is clearly doing something. Now, but you know, unlike with say the the those little cancer studies where 70% of people were in remission six months later, what you begin to see here is that the difference between the placebo and the 25 blue, the 25 milligram arm vanish after week six. Uh, the way they show it here, it looks like the 25 milligram arm lost effectiveness. There are other ways of interpreting these data that don't show that, but no matter how you look at it, what happened basically was over time, the, the effect became no longer statistically significant in this fairly large study, suggesting that there's some, whatever that benefit is that's so apparent in the red circle it's not nearly as uh, apparent in the purple circle on this graph. Now, Robin Card Harris had done a sm very much smaller, like 20 person TRD study a number of years earlier, three, four years earlier, saw the same pattern. So now in this population, these are people that have been depressed for an extended period. By definition, they've failed previous uh, treatments. You see a benefit, you see that it's rapid, that's good. The benefit is substantial, that's great. It lasts for quite a while, but it doesn't seem to last forever. And if you look at their rates of remission, um, look at the red circle here. At week 12, they had a 26% remission rate with the Madras, right? At week one, that remission rate was like 30%. You can see that day two is their best shot. And you can see it drops down. They get a little bit better at week 12, which is interesting. But the the so you get these remission rates in, in, in the mid-20s. And there's two ways of looking at it. One is, oh my God, these people are treatment resistant. They had one dose of a drug and three months later, a quarter of them are in remission. That is kind of a miracle, right? But a quarter of the people in remission uh, is not the kind of miracle that people were thinking about. And in fact, if you take a look at this 26% at 12 weeks, compare it with remission rates in the STAR-D study, which was the largest study ever done of, of standard antidepressants, 12 weeks of, of citalopram pushed to a high dose of 40 milligrams when needed produced a remission rate between 25% with the HAMD and here 33% with the quids. Point being that the remission rates at 12 weeks uh, in the COMPASS uh, psilocybin study in TRD look a lot like the remission rates in, in, in uh, STAR-D. And STAR-D was a messy, difficult population. So, you know, the populations are somewhat synonymous. You can't really compare across studies, but we do. And and the point being here, so it looks like there is potentially, there's a conflation. The fact that the cancer studies were done in a small academic center, that's going to up their effectiveness. But still, there's a little bit of a suggestion that, that the, the, the disorders we treat may dictate how effective these agents are. And that not surprisingly, when you come to people who've been depressed for an extended period, they fail prior uh, uh, medications. Their brains are probably somewhat differently wired now that they've taken a bunch of other antidepressants. That when you toss all this in and their lives are often very problematic, either because their lives are problematic or because the depression has helped make their life problematic. It, it, it's not, you know, it's not rocket science. It's not a shock that, that the psychedelics may not be as effective, but it was a shock to the field. And, you know, um, companies' stocks fell uh, you know, in response to those early data that were not the miracle cure people were looking for. Well, okay, so that's TRD, right? These are people that have failed other things. What about major depression disorder writ large? And one of the things that pleases me about the work I get to do with USONA Institute is that we elected and we were encouraged by the FDA back in the day to not pursue TRD, not treatment resistance only, but major depressive disorder writ large, the whole thing. So you could have TRD or you could not have TRD. You could have been depressed for 10 years. You could have been depressed for 10 weeks. Um, uh, you know, the whole range of people. And we got a wide range of people in the study that I'm about to tell you about that was published last fall um, that, we, that we published in JAMA. 
uh, just I, a call out to all the amazing people at, at 11 uh, treatment sites that took part in this trial. We had a lot of just fantastic people. So what did we do? This looks like a rat ran through it, but it's actually not that complex. We recruited people that had MDD. They had to be reasonably medically healthy. They had to have um, you know, significant depressive symptoms. They had to maintain those symptoms between screening and baseline because sometimes people get a cure just coming into a study. Those people then could not proceed. They got their prep. Uh, they got dosed with two facilitators in the room. They got either 25 milligrams or 100 milligrams of niacin. Niacin was this older legacy uh, comparator agent. It makes it causes some flushing. There was a feeling that I think, and I think this is probably not particularly relevant, but there was this feeling that it maybe would help hide the psilocybin by making people flush a little bit, but whatever, it doesn't have antidepressant effects. People were randomized one-to-one. -one. They got 25 psilocybin. They got the 100 milligrams of niacin. They were assessed at you know, day two, day eight, day 15. Our primary endpoint was day 43. So we, we had a six-week primary endpoint in this study if the groups did not separate at six weeks, it's, you know, kind of party over, right? We did not allow people to restart antidepressants. And in fact, very few people did. It's interesting. The vast bulk of people white knuckled it out at least to day 43 to six weeks. So what did we find, not in a treatment resistant depressed population, but in an MDD population? Well, here's the standard way of looking at it. Again, we're starting at zero because we're looking at change here. Down is good. Minus 20 for me, this just means that your madras depression score dropped by 20 points. Psilocybin is the bottom line. Niacin is the top line. Time is across the bottom, days, right? And you can see basically that, and I'm going to bracket. Somebody could ask me if we have time afterwards why we think we didn't see that immediate effect one day post-dosing. But certainly by one week post-dosing, you see essentially the entire effect. It's a large effect. People improve uh, eventually by almost 20 points on the madras. It's totally better than the niacin. You don't need a statistician to see this. Um, and notice that there's no loss of separation with placebo. In fact, the biggest difference between placebo and psilocybin in this study occurred at day 29, which is a month out, right? Um, so here we're not seeing that decrement of effect, and we're not seeing a bunch of people needing to go back on antidepressants in either arm, actually. There's another way of looking at these data that I love and that I'd never heard of and the journal made me do, and I will now never not publish a clinical trial without this kind of waterfall graph. Let me quickly explain it to you if you've not seen one. Each orange line is a person that got psilocybin. Each bluish line is a person that got the placebo. It looks like there's a mountain rising up to a peak in the middle of the chart. That gray line on both sides, those are the scores that the people started with. How far the line drops is actually how much better they got. So let's look at the orange lines first. You can see there's a number of them that got all the way down to zero. That means they went from having very high depression scores to no depression scores. And you can see then there's a lot of orange lines that are you know good, but not that good. What about the blue lines? Well, I count three that went down to zero with placebo. I mean, this, they got a miracle cure from coming in, laying on a couch and taking an inactive niacin. There were others that did pretty well. But again, you don't need stats to see that there's a lot more orange lines that are long than there are blue lines that are long. And now lines that are pointing up are people that did worse from start to finish in the study. You can also see there's more of those in the placebo group. Um, but there's a couple of few of those in the psilocybin group. And this is kind of important. I count uh, five of them, right? Now look at the psilocybin, and this is really interesting. There is a wide range in how people did. There are a, There's a group of people that did spectacularly well. Then there's another group of people that either got a little bit worse or really, you know, they got like seven or eight points better. That's nothing, right? Do you see how many of those there are? There's a wide range of response, and this graph shows you that. And it, boy, you know, one of the things it highlights is, you know, if we could understand the, me the, 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 the mechanism of action better, can we, are there ways that we can get more people down into those long spaghetti lines on the psilocybin side? And if I go back to this figure real quickly, uh, you know, look at the, the placebo, the niacin. So we get about a seven point improvement with the, with the niacin. That's, uh, that's about what Compass got with their one milligram dose. But in a standard antidepressant study where you're comparing a pill uh, antidepressant with a pill placebo, you'd see more of a 12 to 13 point 
drop with the placebo. You get, you know, the the we're not getting a huge placebo response, and it's 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 over puffing. It's puffing up our uh, what we're what we're seeing because FDA is interested in the placebo adjusted response rate. If you don't get much placebo response, then your active treatment looks really better. But if you don't get enough of a placebo response, then it looks like you're not doing your study right. So there's a really fine line there. It's good that we got some placebo response. There's, there are some studies uh, with psychedelics where people in the placebo group actually did worse over time. It's a nocebo. That's a real problem. So we got a placebo response, but frankly, we'd like to see a little bit of a better one. We'd like to see more response on both sides of this graph. Let's look at remission and response. So just look at the little the boxes I've yellowed. Uh, niacin at, at six weeks, day 43, there's an 11% remission rate, 44% remission rate with the psilocybin. So here in this study of MDD, we have a 44% remission rate at uh, week six. It, the remission rate in, in the TRD study by Compass was about you know 26%, 27% at week six. So we're getting a lot more remission. We're getting more response. Again, consistent with this idea that in this MDD population, we're getting a bigger signal than they got in TRD. You, again, with the caveat that you really can't compare across studies with any certainty, is there any evidence that maybe TRD versus non-TRD makes a difference? And I offer this up to you only as a suggestion, but we went in in our study and we looked at this. So interestingly, in the USONA MDD study, only 13% of the population, only 13 people basically, met criteria for TRD. There's a set criteria for it. Look at the look at the psilocybin uh, column and look at the things I've yellowed. And you can see what it says with psilocybin. If you had treatment resistance, you improved by 14 and a half points at week six. If you did not, you improved by almost 20 points. So that's almost a, a five and a half point difference. That's, that's a lot of a difference. You also got less of a placebo. Uh, interestingly, you got more of a placebo response if you had treatment resistance. So the, the placebo adjusted difference was even bigger. Now, it was not significant at week six, but it, the, the treatment resistant group, even with these very small numbers, they did statistically worse at week one, week two, and week four. Um, this is interesting, right? So there's a suggestion in this study that yes, treatment resistance may be a predictor of not doing as well with psilocybin. I have a, a, a private little theory that, that the optimal use of these agents, if they were financially viable in this regard, would be to consider things like psilocybin as a first treatment early in the course of a disease state. Um, because, you know, these, 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 because these treatments, because psilocybin, when it works, it tends to induce these long-term benefits. Um, I wonder if they might not be useful as disease modifying agents. We'll see in our phase three, we'll be looking at this question again, but to me, it's one of the key questions in the field. Now I'm going to, you know, the title of the talk is psilocybin for depression, but my buddy, uh, Rob Barrow is the CEO of MindMed. And I, I, I want to highlight this study. It hasn't been published yet. So I'm just showing what they put up online. It's not peer reviewed, but they did a study at, where they looked at LSD for generalized anxiety disorder. And it's a very interesting study, what we know about it so far. First off, it's 12 weeks. Um, it is almost 200 patients. It's large. They make a big deal about the fact that they had no psychotherapeutic intervention. So they didn't really prep people much beforehand other than just sort of basic information. The people that were in the room with uh, during the dosing day did not interact and they had no integration sessions. Um, now, the other thing that's impressive about it is it's the first true dose response, dose finding study uh, in the literature of psychedelics. They had five arms, which is impressive. Um, what they find, uh, well, here is the HAMA. This is the clinician rated uh, generalized anxiety uh, metric. And uh, pretty beautiful, right? Uh, placebo is the, the, the pinkish line. Look, uh, I'm gonna, they have a, a more robust placebo response Interestingly, in terms of generalized anxiety disorder, the 100 microgram dose worked better than the 200 microgram dose. That's really useful data. This is the first time anybody's been able to show a graph like this, and, and kudos to them. They also looked at uh, uh, depression scores with the same instrument that we used at USONA and the Compass used. Interestingly, they found about a 19, 20 point drop just like we did. That's really interesting. Of course, this is LSD. The depressive symptoms are two highest doses were overlapping with each other and much better. 
than their their low dose. But look at their placebo. They got, remember I said we got about a six point placebo response. They had to double that. And I can't help but wonder if the fact that they really didn't make much of the integration stuff, they they weren't kind of rubbing people's faces in the fact that they, you know, if you had a placebo, you tend not to have a psychedelic-like experience. This is very interesting and it's worth tracking. But I pointed out to you that just for a couple of reasons that, you know, um, it's a dose finding study and they explicitly didn't said they didn't do psychotherapy. And as we think about mechanism of action, this becomes interesting. Of course, the, the psychedelic still has very powerful psychoactive effects. So in the time we have left, let's turn to this um, because uh, I want to suggest to you that how we think about the mechanism of action of psychedelics is likely going to help explain why they perhaps have a longer effect in some conditions than others, and also how they're likely to be dosed upon FDA approval or frankly, upon these legalization strategies. So let's go into mechanism. You know, if, you, if, if you've ever been depressed, and you've ever taken a standard antidepressant, and if you've ever benefited from taking that antidepressant, I bet you've had an experience like I've had, which is you're feeling depressed and anxious. You start taking a pill, and about 10 days later, you wake up one morning, and for reasons you could never explain, you just feel better. You know, the sun's shining, you look out the window, and you, you go, well, you know, what was I so upset about? Um, it, it's the damnedest thing if you've ever experienced it. But it comes out of nowhere, right? It, it's not like anything in your life has changed usually. You just feel different. All of a sudden, you just feel confident. You feel, you know, um, psychedelics are very different than that. Um, psychedelics produce these profound, acute experiences on a dosing day. And there are now ample data that the quality of the psychedelic experience that's induced, as you know, I'm not probably telling you anything you don't know, but the quality of that experience pretty strongly predicts outcomes in almost every study. Um, I'm going to point out just two of these sort of, of, of constructs around the psychedelic experience. One is this mystical experience, which is this sort of very positive emotional state where you feel deeply connected with the world at large, with God, with other things, the sense that there's a sense of sacredness either in this world or in another one, that there's this transcendent meaning that your life is part of something larger that you ever than you ever realized. It has these different characteristics to it, but it very much a dissolving of the sense of separateness, but in a way that is emotionally wonderful. That That's the mystical experience. Emotional breakthroughs like a catharsis, which, you know, psychedelics have an unnerving and eerie way of bringing you face to face with the things you don't want to think about in your life that you're repressing. And that repression we now know drives things like depression, anxiety, psychedelics put them right in front of your face. Uh, if you're able to look at them, deal with them, accept them if you can't change them, um, sit with them during the session. When people do that, they have a sort of breakthrough, like, oh, I'm going to die of cancer. I want to, instead of being depressed and miserable, I'm so glad I had a life. I, I'm going to make the most of the time I have left. Or, oh my God, you know, I'm drinking every day and I need to stop because it's ruining my life, you know, and I am going to stop, right? That, these are these sort of emotional breakthrough. When either one of these or both of these happen, people tend to have much better long-term outcomes. So, 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 you know, the obvious thing there is, hmm, this sort of sounds like psychotherapy on steroids or, you know, a year of psychotherapy in a day, as the cliche goes, that there's some sort of conscious experience that causes a person to see the world in a different way that is embodied and emotionally powerful, very salient, that then you, you can't look at things the same anymore, you know? Um, uh, because this keeps associating with outcomes, maybe the way we should think about a mechanism of action is that it is more like psychotherapy, that it's a it's a, a change, the consciousness gets changed. But there is a very strong movement right now in the psychedelic development and research space to see it very differently, to see it more in line with how we tend to think about antidepressants, which is that it's a non-conscious, bottom-up, strictly biologic process. And indeed, in animal models, both ketamine over on the right and certain psychedelics over on the left have these, you know, strong neuroplastic effects. They, they drive the production of new brain cells in the frontal cortex. They cause, you know, upregulation. They, they cause upregulation of amper receptor signaling. They drive BDNF. That drives mTOR. You get synaptic, gen synaptic genesis. 
Um, antidepressants, you know, regular old Prozac, Paxley things do the same thing, but much more slowly and on a more restricted level. And so that what's really going on here is that psychedelics are just like regular old antidepressants, just more so. They have these troublesome psychological effects that we need to, to get rid of. Um, because what we're really doing is just jacking up neuroplasticity. This has led to a lot of questions about this. This was a New York Times article. Now, interestingly, to date, the vast bulk of these data have all been in animals and whether animals are how they line up with humans in terms of these drugs is a really complex question. But I, I, I don't mean to make fun of this. I take this very seriously. I'm a great admirer of David Olson, the guy at Delix who's been working on this in this whole space trying to come up with psychoplastogens, agents that, you know, you could take them Saturday morning at home and you would not have an experience, but Sunday morning you'd wake up, be cured of your depression and not have to take another pill for six months. I mean, that would utterly change the field of psychiatry and, and psychopharmacology. And it would certainly make psychedelics, uh, standard psychedelics, novelty items. I mean, who needs the trip if you can just, you know, take it at home. People are really, really pursuing this, but you can see that that these can be seen as these sort of in a dialectical opposition with each other that has to be one or the other. Now, I and many researchers do not think it has to be one or the other, that it likely is both, but I want to highlight these very different perspectives, right? So, uh, you know, what are the data for things? Well, I, w there are some pretty robust data on the fact that the psychedelic experience seems to predict later outcomes. I'm showing you unpublished data now from our USONA phase two study of a single 25 milligram dose of psilocybin for people with major depressive disorder. We looked at the MEQ30, which is a mystical experiences measure. We looked at the emotional breakthrough inventory, which gets an emotional breakthrough. Both mystical experience and emotional breakthrough went up significantly in response to psilocybin. We had people report the day after the, the dosing. We, this is just a path analysis, basically. And we found in this study that it was the mystical experience that carried the day, that in fact, the, that that the the invoking of a mystical experience during the psychedelic dosing session predicted almost all the antidepressant response, uh, almost all the placebo adjusted antidepressant response, which is even more powerful. So in this study, in the study that I you know that I oversaw, um, mystical experience was the deal. You know, to the you could just look at it as as you had more and more of one of those acute experiences, you had less and less depression weeks and weeks later. Now, in that big compass phase two study of treatment-resistant depression, I've shown you again the graph over on the left for your memory. They, being you know more of a commercial pharmaceutical company, did not ask about mystical experience, but they did look at emotional breakthrough. And this scatter plot shows that, that across the entire population of the study, the more of an emotional breakthrough you had, the more undepressed you were. Um, I, I believe this was three weeks later, but it's the point being that, again, in these larger FDA much very rigorous type studies, you see this signal. There's something about conscious experience that seems to be predicting outcome. Um, but of course, you know, as we all know, correlation is not causation. It could it could well be that that psychedelics are let's they say that there's some latent factor. Psychedelics are doing uh, they're doing a biological effect A, and that effect is driving non-conscious neuroplastic mechanisms that are actually making the difference. And it's also driving the psychological effects. The psychological effects are just along for the ride. They are not in, on a causal pathway with the antidepressant effect. There, it's just an association, in which case you should be able to block the psychological effects. And as long as you don't block the underlying biological effects, you should see Either you lose the antidepressant response because you got to have the psychological effects, or you keep this the antidepressant response, in which case you now have a pretty good sense that although you think it's important for you to have this sort of very potent, sacred experience, the experience may be useful for you, but it's not what's on the main line for, for these uh, drugs being developed for depression. So we've we've started this 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 series of, as I say here, crazy studies. And we're gearing up to do a slightly less crazy study out in Colorado. And I thought I'd talk about them for a minute just for your interest, because this is my private academic obsession is trying to understand what is the role of conscious experience in the in the, the therapeutically relevant behavioral effects of psilocybin. 
So I'm not going to do, but we have this really interesting study where we recruit folks and we, um, we give them 25 milligrams of oral psilocybin. And we also co-administer midazolam or Versed, which you can find a dose of Versed, which makes people amnestic for their experience while they're still conscious. It's like a blackout, like a drinking blackout, right? So I had the bright idea that we might be able to co-administer midazolam. And if people could still have a psychedelic experience that they subsequently forgot, we would at least be able to ask the question of whether or not you have to remember the experience for it to have therapeutic benefit. So we started this study and we've run eight people. We did a pilot study with eight people and we found something interesting. We found that it's really hard to forget your psychedelic experience. We started co-administering a dose of psilocybin, uh, of midazolam that, that should make you, you know, forget what you did last night at the party. Uh, people remembered. So we upped the dose three times. And so we accidentally did a sort of dose response study where um, I'm going to show you, let's look over here, look at the subjects. You see on the bottom, it says subject number. Number one is the first subject. Number eight is the last subject. And from number one to eight, we kept raising that dose of midazolam. This is the score on the emotional breakthrough inventory that the patients completed the day after dosing. And you could not ask for a better sort of tanking of, of this particular variable, right? Um, now, what's interesting, what I haven't said is that during, if we go back here for a second, during about four times during the, the actual dosing day, we would interrupt people and ask them to speak into a tape recorder. Like, what are you experiencing? And we'd have them complete uh, four or five items from the altered states of consciousness questionnaire. And we people, while they were having the psychedelic experience with the midazolam on board, they swore they were having a psychedelic experience. They rated it actually highly. And the higher the dose of midazolam, the more they thought they were having a powerful experience at the time. But then the day after, it's gone. And then a week later, we had them fill out one of these PEQ questions. Do you believe that the experience and your contemplation of that experience has led to a change in your current sense of personal well-being? Again, from patient one to patient eight, you see this complete tanking, where basically by the time we're really tanking up on the midazolam, a week later, people go, no, no, it didn't. The experience had no long-term effect on me. Now, this is a very small, obviously, it's a little pilot study. We we have funding to do a much larger study, which we're going to commence with a placebo control and everything. But it is interesting. It does suggest that there's that you, you need to take something with you out of the experience and that there's some biology that the midazolam is interrupting. Um, we don't know whether that biology is a post-dosing neuroplastic effect that's being blocked by the midazolam or whether the midazolam, despite the fact that people swear they're having a psychedelic experience, maybe there's some salience that's lost during the experience. We don't know, but just to say that it's very, very interesting that there clearly is a biology that 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 midazolam is opening up and letting us potentially look at. One of the things midazolam does, of course, is it blocks the stress response. And one of our colleagues on the recap study at, at UW, uh, Cody Wenther, has been doing these studies in animals and rodents, showing that that psilocybin induces a pretty potent stress response. And in rodents, if you block that stress response, they, they, they did it in a couple of ways. If you block the cortisol response, you don't get the behavioral effect. So you can give little rodents like uh, you know psilocybin. Uh, and if you do that and then put them in an anxiety paradigm, they after they are done with the psilocybin, they, they show an anti-anxiety effect. You can block that effect if you block the stress response. And this would be consistent with this idea that psychedelics uh, induce a conscious sort of stressful, good stressful, bad stressful, but a highly salient experience in humans. And that that is doing something neurobiologically that's that's kicking off or baking in some sort of change in perspective that then produces uh, therapeutic benefits. And of course, you know, uh, this is an interesting quote. It says, for the previous two decades, the American Psychiatric Association has focused on reducing negative affective symptoms through pharmacologic means, whereas the American Psychological Association has endorsed therapies that engage challenging emotional content. There's a number of them. And I want to suggest to you that if this perspective is right, um, one way of thinking about what we're doing with psychedelics is that's exactly what we're doing in many people. We're engaging this sort of difficult uh, content. Now, it's increasingly obvious, though, that people... Um, that people, uh, that this engagement can cause harm for people sometimes too. So we are getting ready to do a, a much larger 140 person, this is wrong, actually it should be 140 people study out in Vail, Colorado at a new institute that we've established out there, a new research institute. 
where we're going to treat 140 people with a 25 milligram dose of, of psilocybin and then look to see whether we can enhance the salience of the psychedelic experience by adding a, a non-invasive form of vagus nerve stimulation in the week after dosing to see if we can sort of bake in the power of the, or you know bake in the salience of the psychedelic experience. We're also gonna do some really nifty, very complex dynamical system modeling that comes out of psychotherapy research to see if we can better understand when do the psychedelic experiences, when they're intense, when do they produce benefit? When do they produce harm? So, you know, it's going to take a couple of years to do a study like this, but stay tuned. And it's around this question of, you know, a lot of our work is, can we see how relevant the conscious experience is and what is the biology that subserves it? And then can we enhance the conscious experience to enhance the antidepressant effects? So I'm, I'm almost done my last couple of slides. And so I think, you know, if it, if it turns out to be the case that, that, that something like psilocybin is not just a super Prozac. You know, it might be that you get this sort of acute neuroplastic effect that makes you feel undepressed for three weeks. And it may be that these things are dosed every three weeks down the road. That would be the sort of pharmacologic way of doing it. And that's very much this, right? That you're depressed as all stink. You come in, you, you, you pull off your psilocybin, it's another drug, and then you're treated and you're fine, right? Um, I think data are increasingly suggesting that something like this is going to be true for many people, which is you come in with your depression. You have a medication session that gives you some short-term relief, probably, that may be more directly neurobiological, but you also induce these longer-term change in perspectives and feelings that then help you as you begin to sort of think about your depression, to begin to take a different perspective on it, perhaps to begin to engage with different things in your life that are going to, to over time, sort of enhance your ability to get out of a depressed state. All right, so answers. How do we get here and why have psychedelics created such a ruckus? Well, you know, I want to suggest to you that at least, I think to some degree, it's a combination of the inadequacy of current pharmacology, com pharmacology combined with widespread use of psychedelics by baby boomers and early data showing these protracted benefits from a single treatment that probably will not hold up as we move into more severely chronically depressed people. Will different depressive conditions respond differently to psilocybin? Will this affect how they are used or FDA approved? Yes, we don't know yet. It's gonna depend on long-term studies that are underway on how they will be labeled in different populations. How do psychedelics work? And I wanna to suggest to you, it may depend on the time frame. I do think these agents probably have short-term sort of neuroplastic effects that may give people you know, this idea of a, of a, a sort of afterglow period. Um, uh, and I think that there's something about a combination of the experiences people have in the dosing session combined with that, maybe as Gold Dolan has said, this opening of this sort of uh, critical period afterwards where you're more open to rethinking things. Uh, so a combination of acute experience and subsequent neuroplastic effects, uh, many of us are interested in this and are working on it. And then what is consciousness-based pharmacology? You know, as I said, you know, we've been so used to agents that produce their effects slowly when they do produce those effects and do it without any sort of immediate conscious experience that I think we're trying to fit every square peg into that round hole. Of course, you know, things like cocaine and heroin that produce very powerful and often euphoric acute effects turn out to be very bad actors. So, so things like psychedelics, you know, come in on the shoulders of problematic agents. But I do want to suggest that a consciousness-based pharmacology is something that would, would synthesize the fact that, of course, psychedelics have immediate and profound biological effects, but those effects uh, may, you know, those effects both induce and interact with the consciousness effects that they, that they produce. And so that we might think about other strategies for pharmacologic agents that induce uh, conscious states that then, that those states themselves become agents of transformation and therapeutic benefit.